Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Betsy Hill and Roger Stark about neuroplasticity and how it pertains to learning. Betsy Hill and Roger Stark, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to be here. Yes, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with you both. Roger, you're joining us from Wisconsin. Betsy, you're joining us from the Chicago area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about neuroplasticity and how it pertains to learning. Um, Now, I know you both work uh, predominantly with children and and cognitive skills and such. Um, So we'll unpack that. Uh, the the concept of neuroplasticity in that context, but we'll also relate it a little bit to the workplace and what this means for training and development and the learning and development uh, fields in organizations, how we can upskill and reskill our teams in effective ways. As we get started, I wanted to share Betsy and Roger's bios with everybody. Betsy Hill is the mother of three boys and an award-winning educator. She studied neuroscience of learning from Dr. Patricia Wolf and other pioneers in the field, coining the term neuroeducator. She is former chair of the board of trustees at Chicago State University and teaches strategic thinking at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management, where she received a contribution to Learning Excellence Award. Roger Stark is CEO of Brainware Learning Company. It started with a simple question, what do you know about the brain? His vision was to combine multidisciplinary clinical cognitive training with video game technology. It had never been done before, and over the past 15 years, he has championed efforts to bring comprehensive cognitive skills training and cognitive assessment within the reach of everyone. Now, I could speak to both of your backgrounds a lot more, but I'm going to pause there. Anything you would both like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? You did a perfect job, and you led with the fact that I'm the mother of three boys and now the grandmother of two girls. So, And for what it's worth, I got 19 godchildren. Well, let's start with just generally opening up around the idea of cognitive skills. Um, Why is it important to be thinking about cognitive skill development? And what is the role of neuroplasticity in the development of cognitive skills? It's both great questions. So cognitive skills are the basic ways we take in world uh, information from the world into our brains. So um, learning is about, you know, understanding things, doing things differently, but essentially it's actually about changing the brain. We physically change the brain. We make different connections among neurons and and, uh, when we do that. And cognitive skills are how that happens. So skills like attention, working memory, visual and auditory processing. This is how we start the learning process. Uh, And then what we do with it, making decisions, applying it, using that information, Um, are all part of our cognitive processes. And so when we understand those, we can actually improve the way that we learn. And neuroplasticity is the fundamental reason that that is possible because we can change the brain to a much greater degree than people have generally uh, understood that to be. There's now broad consensus in the scientific community about neuroplasticity. And it's amazing what can happen when you don't assume that intelligence is fixed and when you know mm-hmm. that these processes can change. Yeah, I would like just to add to that, that there was a perception for many, many years that whatever cognitive ability you were born with, whatever cognitive ability you came to school with, that was really all the cognitive ability that you had or that you would ever need to be successful in school. Um, the world has changed. The complexities of our environment, of our cultures. Uh, So not everybody comes to school prepared the same way. 
Uh, and we believe that the most underutilized asset in this whole learning and teaching process is the student. Yes, we are born with the capacity to learn. That's what human beings do. But our capacity for learning is shaped by our environment and our genetics and our life experiences. And our cognitive ability defines our learning capacity. And all, despite all of those things affecting or shaping who we are, our environment, our genetics, and our life experiences, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. That has not, does not have to define you. Or if you want to do something different about that, you can, but you just have to do differently. And you referred, Betsy, as you were talking about neuroplasticity, you referred to, you know, what I hear a lot of talk around is this idea of fixed mindset versus growth mindset, right? And so if we recognize that we're not stuck where we're at, like we literally can develop new ways of learning and growing, um, it, not only does it bring hope to to us, you know, in terms of just progression in our lives and in our our uh, our experiences uh, with our families and our communities. Uh, but it, 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 it means when we approach learning that way, that we can develop uh, in many ways that perhaps we didn't even think were possible. And I think of, uh, for example, math, my wife is a, a math professor. She teaches stats and in business mm. calculus and those sorts of subjects. Lots of people have you know, math anxiety. Lots of people have been told since the time they were kids that they're not a math person, that they're stupid. You know, they can't do math. Um, and it, that's a horrible thing to tell a kid. You shouldn't say that, um, first of all, but it's a, it's a common experience that many children have and they carry it with them their whole lives, just thinking, oh, I'm not a math person. And so one of the things she has to do at the university is just help to break down those those barriers, the the negative self talk, the the expectations that people put on you over time, uh, and to help the students actually recognize that they can do it. Like this is something they can not only do, but they can enjoy and they can be good at, um, regardless of whether you know they felt like they were good at it before. Um, that's kind of her superpower is like her ability to break down the resistance, you know, and the math anxiety and those sorts of things. And to me, that's speaking directly to this idea of growth mindset or the the neuroplasticity um, approach to how we go about teaching and learning. We, there's so much misconception about growth mindset and what that means. I mean, for example, I can have all the growth mindset in the world about my ability to play basketball, but uh, I'm not going to be able to take on LeBron James or Michael Jordan, regardless of my growth mindset. So the first thing you have to have with a growth mindset is the willingness to do what you need to do to get better. And that just doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I'll, uh, that's the point I want to make. I'll, bet you, I'll let Betsy wrap up on that. Yeah, well, the, the concept comes from the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford, as I'm sure you know. And it really is about fundamentally understanding that we um, talents and intelligence are developed, not innate. And so even when we find people who are gifted in a particular area or whatever, they they still have to work at it. And, um, and basically the research found that uh, people with a grown mindset, when they do brain scans of them, if they make a mistake and they're getting feedback, their brains are really active because they just want to figure it out. They want to understand that. And if we can instill that, then it doesn't matter that you don't get math the first time or the second time, or maybe even the hundredth time. If you, you know, there there are ways to, to get that and we can grow these skills, even the, the ones that we didn't think, oh, I can never be a math student or I can never have uh you know i'm never going to be able to um you know uh read and understand complex concepts that's not that's not true and uh we can always develop to a far greater degree that that we recognize ourselves many times if if i may add to that at, at the core of what we're about we're about burn, building learning capacity and we do that through the science of learning Everything in education today is focused on the science of teaching. And we spend all of our efforts and our 
resources focusing on the science of teaching. And Lord knows that's very, very important. I mean, our teachers spend an inordinate amount of money getting their teaching degrees. They have a lot of continuous education courses to keep their license currents, et cetera. We spend a lot of money on teaching. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Do you have you ever thought about the one place where we spend no money on training for a division or a group of people? Have you ever thought about that before? Uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll tell you one place we don't spend ten cents hardly on preparing our children to learn. Uh, we we everything we do is we get training. Even in your career, I don't know what what you've done historically, and and you're obviously quite capable. But even if you're very capable and you go from one company to another, and they hire you because of all your skills and ability. You're still going to have to be trained in how that particular organization wants things done. There is their way, whatever that might be. We train everybody everywhere, but we never think about training our children and developing their capacity for learning. But yet, everyone will say the seed of the challenges with only about a third of our children performing grade work level proficiently, it's because of the parents, it's because of the home. You got a lazy kid. You got they don't work to their potential. They don't have the ability. They're difficult. They got lousy parents. They got this. They got that. I often ask a lot of times when I'm talking to parents, which I love to do, is how many times you sit in a parent teachers meeting, and the teacher says, "I've got to tell you something. The reason your son's challenging is I'm not a particularly good teacher." And I often get a big laugh if they've ever heard that from a teacher. No, they never have. Because teachers don't know about learning either. They know about teaching. And our whole position, the reason we're on this call, is about widening people's lens to look at the student in this whole part. They play a role. God did not create any junk. And he didn't start with any child you've ever met or you ever will meet. So we need to think about incorporating the science of learning with the science of teaching. It's time to look at that as a, as a duet. You got the teacher, you got the student. Blessings to help that teacher. But we need to think about preparing that student because they come to school so at a disadvantage about their learning that we all just don't come to school prepared to learn the same way. And that we don't have to. And if you really want to talk about social justice, if that's something that's meaningful, or if you want to talk about equity, you empower a child with the ability to read and to comprehend and to think and to reason and to problem solve on their own. They're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. We should be focusing, number one, on preparing our children to learn. And where we go in and do work in our work, with about a third of our children performing proficiently today at grade level, when we go in, we jump that up to 50 to 60%. And just so you know, economically, we cannot survive at turning out our students today at 30% proficiency at grade level. Forget China and Russia. We're going to collapse from within. We will not have the economic stability to support our way of life. So this is something that needs to be looked at, evaluated, and addressed, and turned inside out and upside down. And I would say education warp speed because we've been doing the same thing for the same way for 100 years. We made the assumptions that children come to school with X, as I said earlier. And we know there's no question and people will tell you that. That's not the case. And uh, now 20% of our high school graduating seniors with a diploma in their hand cannot read their own diploma. Over almost 60% of our first year college students need either basic remedial reading, writing, math classes. 42% of our workforce today is workplace illiterate because they don't possess the skills to utilize the tools to drive productivity. 54% of our a, workforce. That's a really important thing to, to think about too, is that these concepts we're talking about are about school, but they're also about the workplace yeah. and the kinds of skills that, that companies are prioritizing and that people need to have the ability to learn and to relearn and to relearn and to relearn and to upscale and to upskill and all those things because the world is changing so fast. The skills that companies put priorities on, things like adaptability, things like uh, the ability to adjust and to, to learn new things, those are cognitive skills. And there, there are ways to address them and to develop, not just by explaining to someone how you can be more adaptable, but that there are mental processes. And the mental process that I use to 
um, to shift gears and to think of a different way to solve a problem is the same one that I use when I'm reading or when I'm doing math and I and I have to you know apply a different operation that the, those are cognitive processes that can be strengthened. Yeah, that's absolutely certain. There's no doubt about that. I think that the learner of the future, the best job skill to have, if you want a strong, employable future, is to learn how to learn. Because things are going to change so fast that whatever you think you're going into that company to do today and what tools you think you're going to utilize to be successful, I got to tell you, in a year or two years, it's going to be something different, and it's going to be something different. So employers are going to look for people that can learn quickly, efficiently, effectively, and be able to take those new learning skills at a highly accelerated rate and deploy them in the workplace for productivity. Yeah. So you mentioned the importance of a learning approach, learning skills, learning mindset, in addition to a focus on teaching, right? And whether we're in a K through 12 system, um, you know, pedagogy and the research around effective teaching, that's important. You, we want to have effective methods and how we teach, um, but we also need to to help others understand how to learn. And that is well stated. Uh, I think in the learning and development space in organizations, this is something that, um, you know, the, the, the more progressive organizations have been leaning into. Uh, I think in university settings where, um, you know, again, the, the more cutting edge progressive universities are leaning into this idea of of teaching learning skills and helping individuals become lifelong learners. I know I'm a professor and I know that it's one of the things that I emphasize with my students all the time. Um, you know, I, I teach training and development, learning and development, HR um, stuff at the university. And, you know, the vast majority of everything they're learning in the program is not going to even be the same or even relevant necessarily in five or 10 years. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that I'm developing the skill sets that will allow them to, to be successful in the future, regardless of whether the technical um, knowledge that they need to be successful today is the same, you know, uh, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, and so we really do need to lean into this idea of learning how to learn, how to be lifelong learners who can be agile and adaptive in a rapidly changing marketplace. You know, the the the, the jobs of today are not the jobs of yesterday. And ultimately, uh, if I want to be relevant in my field, if I want to be relevant in my career, I will have to be adaptive and constantly learning and growing. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I will literally just lose relevancy. I will not have the 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 knowledge necessary, or the skill sets, or the capabilities necessary to be a contributor in in the future of work if I don't learn how to learn. As and people who have uh, made themselves obsolete by not learning uh, and not continuing to pay attention to what's going on in the environment and all those sorts of things. I uh, teach strategic thinking in an MBA program. And a lot of it is about um, the, the concepts and thinking more broadly and being able to uh, use those tools, but they, it applies to everything. It's not just about strategy in a company. Uh, yeah. We can look at our personal strategies. We can look at strategies for our families. We can look at um, and it's, it's about the thinking and the processes and, you know, the great, my great joy is, when we get to the end of the course and my students tell me that they think differently and that's what it's all about. She's a, she's a exceptionally good, good teacher. I just might add, <laughs> she's very, very good. At what she does. Uh, one thing I would just like to add, you know, when you look at this stuff, you say, okay, Roger, it, it, it makes general sense, but let's get at the core of the real value propositions. Well, I, I would just say a couple of things. I don't know if perhaps your audience or you are familiar with OECD organization for economic cooperation and development. Um, it, it's uh, one of the large think tanks in the Western Hemisphere about, it looks a lot of democracies and some of our big challenges. And they came out with a, port, a report a few years ago. So this information's uh, got to be at least 10. Uh, the world economy at the time was only about 75 or $76 trillion. And I think now it's well over $100 trillion. So I'm sure these numbers have grown proportionally. But when they came out with a report, 
uh, they made a, a very interesting observation about what's going on in America and uh, the challenges we're faced with in our education. And what really spurred that is the thing called the PISA scores, Program of International Student Assessment. You've heard frequently that they say our students, math students and, and reading students, perform at the bottom of all these Western countries. Uh, and they said, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, if the United States can figure out how to uh, look at their students and, and, and achieve the minimum, not the maximum, we're not talking about South Korean level, we're not talking about Finland's level, third child. but if our students can master the minimum proficiency level of the PISA scores, the minimum, we will uncover this, as I said, just a little bit at a time, it's $73 trillion of GDP, $73 trillion dollars at the time the world was only about 74 trillion dollars when this point came out so that's an enormous economic input uh, it could eliminate all of our social gripes in this country it, it could i mean think about the kind of money that is i mean it's, it's enormous i mean everybody could wear prada every day and throw it away everybody could own a rolls royce everybody could have three squares mills like um, it, it's 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 ridiculous the number what that could do for this country and you sit back and you look at it and so say, can we really get to that? Does that make any sense? Is that too big of a grab? Uh, some people, when I talked about this, they said, I can't even wrap my head around what you're saying, Roger. Well, the reality, what's interesting about it, they said, people are asking, you know, well, how do we go about doing that? So, well, the number one obstacle, the number one obstacle that America has to accept and deal with, with their learning populations, it's a lack of cognitive development. Until they began to deal with the science of learning and understanding how people learn and empower those people with the ability to assimilate, process, comprehend, and apply information effective and effective, nothing's, nothing's going to happen. It's the cognitive is our roadblock. So we, as I said, we need warp speed on looking. If we're concerned about education, if that's real, we, pay, we say that's the difference. I mean, we, I hear a lot of lip service from everybody. But is that if we're really serious, that's the crux of the matter. That's not a symptoms. Education is notorious for dealing with symptoms. That's the root cause. And, and we need to be looking at it, evaluating it, and testing it, and researching it. And probably there needs to be more. But wherever we go and do what we do, what at the outcome, it's going to be easier for an individual to learn, easier for an individual to be taught. Their self-esteem and self-confidence is going to elevate off the charts. Their stress and anxiety levels are going to lower dramatically. Their relationships with their family and their peers will be better. In schools that we've gone into, we've cut visits to the principal's office by 50%. If you know anything that's going on in K-12 education, public education in particular, discipline is out of control. It is out of control. And teachers have all this responsibility, but they have no authority. But man, if you can cut the trips to the principal's office in half, what, what value can that principal radiate throughout his school? Uh, attendance is a big problem. Schools get rewarded on school attendance. We increase that by over 50% of the kids that stay home because when kids don't learn easily and they find it difficult, they don't want to do something that makes them feel bad, that makes them feel like a fool. So they get a headache, they get a time, I don't need to go to school, blah, blah, blah. So these are the things that we can expect if we start to dig into these things, I looked at IBM, they use a cognitive assessment for not going into workforce, but they use it to delineate who they're gonna keep and who they're not gonna keep. So if they hire, they need 25 engineers, they bring in 75 people, they do a cognitive assessment. Oh, 25 people meet their criteria. They throw the other 50 in the trash and they hire the 25. The great thing about our methodology, you don't have to throw those 50 in the trash. We can re rehabilitate most of them and build their capacity so they fit into that 25. And with the workforce needs today, this has never been at a greater need than where it's at. Yeah, the need to reskill and upskill and have constant, continual, lifelong learners uh, is essential. Betsy and Roger, it's been a real pleasure. I note the time and I need to let you go. But before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you and your team and uh, give us a final word on the topic for today. Way to connect with us is at mybrainware.com. Brainware like brain and wear like software. So um, that's the best place. We, we also have a book that we just published this year called 
your child learns differently now what the truth for parents and that's another resource we would uh, welcome to have people explore it's available on the online booksellers we just want to thank everybody for their time and just know one thing god did not create any junk and he didn't start with any child you've ever met or any child you ever will meet and inside every little person there is a special person doing their very best to step inside their best selves to be the best they can be. When you're young and little, everything is new. It's different. They don't know how. But you know what? We can help them with the how. Thank you so much. Betsy, Roger, it's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Betsy and Roger and their team can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. That you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.